my pleasure to introduce um, Ross Taylor from Taylor from Ross Taylor Associates. Ross is a specialist consultant working in the analysis and prevention of waterproofing related defects in high-rise buildings. Ross has been working in this field for over 40 years as a consultant, expert, witness and advisor to regulators. His company, Ross Taylor Associates, provides peer review of new designs prior to construction to address key waterproofing issues. Current projects include Victoria Cross Metro, North Sydney, Sydney Football Stadium, Australian War Memorial, and the Loftus Lane development at Circular Quay. Current rect rectification works include Australian Parliament House, and I don't know if the, some of the parliamentarians have got to move out for that, but uh, it'll be an interesting one. National Gallery, uh, Canberra, and Sydney Opera House. So please welcome Ross to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Let's see. I'd just hasten to add that the work that we're doing at Australian Parliament House has nothing to, to do with the project manager on that, that is known to many of you. It's in fact just a routine maintenance work, not construction failure. So, let's see. Well, it's good to be with you today on this auspicious occasion at this great venue and as the support act for the Commissioner. It's, an, it's a nice change to see you, you all in this venue uh, because as a consultant working in the field of building defects and litigation over the last uh, 20 years, um, I've seen some of you in less comfortable surroundings and it's nice to be just sharing dinner tonight with you guys. So to begin with, I thought I'd just provide an outline of the talk so that you have an idea of what to expect. I believe the primary interest of everybody today is about the new acts and regulations and how they'll impact on their business in practice in future. So I thought it's good to look at the idea behind such legislation with the lens or the framework, the perspective of history and that uh, that has gone before. So we'll begin by looking at building regulation during the Bronze Age in the neighbourhood of Phoenicia, ancient uh, Lebanon, and nearby Mesopotamia. This roughly equates to modern-day Lebanon and Iraq, but we'll look at regulations at this time and similarities with the Commissioner's approach today. We'll then look at the most frequent and expensive defect issue, being waterproofing and facade issues, and look at strategies that you can put in place to manage your risk better. So. Our point of focus is residential apartment buildings. Now, this room, let me see, that's a clicker to the right. Does that look like a building with a leak? Yeah, okay. So this room probably has every link in the high-rise residential building food chain represented. It's an amazing room of people. And we've had substantial growth in the frequency and severity of defects, as David has outlined, over the, and particularly over the last 20 years. And the results from my experience and industry research indicates that waterproofing represents about 80% of the cost of rectification and the cost of litigation of defects in high-rise residential buildings. So that's why it's particularly relevant. Going forward with a, uh, this improvement to the overall industry that David's alluded to. I, in my role, I commonly see four to six million dollar um, defect bills on new residential buildings of 200 units or more. It's the norm, not the exception. And before concluding that such defects are unique to Sydney market, for example, or our modern building industry, it's worth looking at the wisdom of past times to see what history might teach us. So, they're the sort of stains and problems that you've seen in the past. And just before we go to that, the defects cost multiplier is very interesting because when the issue of cost is raised, 
oh, can we afford it? As David said, there was initial pushback. The really the bigger question is, can you afford not to? Because a, a cost of one one item, a one dollar not spent during construction, we find leads to about a hundred dollars after. Um, let me see. Uh, about a hundred dollars at sea. Yeah. See, we we're not able to actually sh see our. Uh, displays up here that's why David had that trouble too so one one dollar not spent during construction we find about ten dollars during construction to to fix and about thirty dollars for a builder or somebody to fix after and about a hundred dollars if the lawyers get involved so it's more a question of can you afford not to address these things so let's look at the the wisdom of history so during the Bronze Age in the Middle East, um, Phoenicia and Mesopotamia, including Babylon, had the most substantial and sophisticated built environment in the world. The, um, in Babylon itself was a city of over 200,000 people, it was the biggest city in the world at the time. And under the rule of Hammurabi, there was a time of accelerated development in the city. And to counter a range of social and property issues, which included problems of building defects, the Code of Hammurabi was introduced. Now, the Code was um, written in 1750 BCE. It had 280 stipulations from, the sixth, uh, from this sixth Babylonian king. And the reason for it was in order that the mighty might not wrong the weak to provide just ways for the waif and the widow, I have inscribed my precious pronouncements upon my stele. And the stele was a basalt piece of steel. This was the equivalent of uh, David's statement on the internet or his blog, I suppose. And this was a, a four-ton piece put in the centre, a square of the centre of uh, Babylon. And the thought, sorts of things that it said... Uh, were quite extraordinary. Personally, it, he, it was about being accountable for um, wrongdoings. So if a man destroys an eye of another man, that'll destroy his eye. So it's the origins of an eye for an eye. It's a bit rough too. It's a bit rough in patches. If um, any man's wife should be seized lying with another male, they should be bind them and cast them into the water. So it was a bit of rough old time. Um, So that was a bit of a rough old time and the trial by ordeal was a, is a constant uh, threat. Um, and when they didn't have a clear answer to a particular case, then people were thrown in the river and if they, if they managed to survive, then they were ac acquitted. And if they didn't, well, they paid the penalty. So in the Code of Hammurabi is a very interesting other uh, one related to the building code. If a builder builds a house for a man and does not make its construction sound, and a wall cracks, that builder shall strengthen that wall at his own expense. Is that what they're saying up there? Yeah. yeah. But it also said that if a man builds a house for a man and it does not make it sound and it collapses and causes the death of the owner, then the builder should be put to death. Now that might have been about being thrown into the river with that ordeal of the river. So you can see there's a bit of a thread there that is common to some of the the regulations that are being talked about now. I, I believe the Commissioner was particularly drawn to the idea of um, throwing people into the river if they were recalcitrant enough, but I think a compliance officer advised against that because of some execution problems with that. But uh, as I understand, if, if none of these regulations work, I think he might be drawn back to it, so we'll see. So the Code of Hammurabi said it was essential to be communicating standards, it was essential to have accountability and the aligning of incentives. So you can see one of those incentives being not to get thrown in the river. In Construct New South Wales, is that the one that's come up now? Yep. It's to educate in form, accountability, consequences and trustworthiness. And what we're going to focus on today is about accountability. 
and particularly accountability with related to this waterproofing issue that is so prevalent in the industry. So, let's have a look. Yeah, sorry? Yeah, might, uh, might be beneficial. It's a little hard uh, when we can't see it, but yeah. Yeah, we might try that. Yeah. Yeah, okay then. Yep. Cool. So, yeah, let's try this. That's a little easier to control. Okay, so with um, just a typical uh, building down now, we can't see it from there. I think we'll have to go back to here. So we'll turn that on. Yep, we'll manage it from here. So with, um, in terms of the essential issue of, uh, can we have that one back on again? Uh, with the essential issue of what is the cause of these waterproofing issues, just like to get to the nub of that issue. And we find that in nine apartment complexes, when we've analysed the cause of it, we find that 81% of it, the leaks are due to design issues. So let's focus on that as the starting point, because very often it's talked about, I think as David mentioned about the tilers that run when he comes onto site, very often when things don't go right, we blame the tiler at the end or the painter at the end. But in fact, the cause of it goes way back, probably three or four years before they even came onto the site. So let's look at accountability in design. One way that the industry views waterproofing is that it's a system of membranes and sealants that create a barrier to water entry. And that right there is the cause of the flaws in design right across the industry. And I'll show you why. Have a look at this example from a building. This is a final design of which it was going to be built on. So you can see we've got uh, a flat slab, there's a hob poured on it, a, a door frame put on, a frame put on the top of that. And see the wording there, slope tiles to floor waste, yeah? And waterproof membrane. Typical of the industry that we see is that the building is designed with all the constraints that are, that are necessary. Net lettable area, floor to ceiling height, heights, council regulations, perhaps even beauty, and then somebody puts a black, thin black line on the drawing afterwards and call it waterproofing. That's where the problem starts. So when I get involved a couple of years down the track, this is what we see. That's that flat slab without any provision for topping and tile bed to falls. Where are they going to create that from? I was on one of the buildings of uh, Rod that's here today, when we measured it up, we found that if they were going to get all the falls, they needed another metre of building height to be able to get the topping and the concrete and the falls in that structure. So there's no way that tiler can get that out of nowhere. And as a result, we get this sort of deterioration and decay where the water can't get away. It just stays there. But we've got that thin black dotted line was going to protect everything. That's the essential flaw in the logic. Similarly, we'll have information like this in a structure. Now, for those of you, there is a bit of Greek in there, and quite frankly, it is all Greek to most of us. But engineers love this stuff. This is a structural engineer's table. And what it says in there, at that bot top right-hand corner, is that the expected movement in 10 years at a construction joint will be 40 millimetres. That 40 millimetres of movement was under that planter box over the top of a uh, surgery in a major hospital. And they had a one millimetre liquid membrane bridging that 40 millimetres. That's the thin black line on the drawing that's put in at the end without regard to how the water is going to get away, without regard to the fundamental nature of water that needs to flow. And as a result, we get everywhere, is the sign of a lack of appreciation of how these materials work. But of course, in this case, we'll blame the sealant guy, if not him, the tiler. But it had nothing to do with them. There was no way that sealant was going to bridge that movement. What about this case? A wonderful building. 
quite, quite beautiful in some ways, unless you're a young construction um, engineer, a foreman on the job that's got to somehow build it and somehow waterproof it. I was called in by this. It was actually called in by a builder that we'd had a litigation against in the couple of years before, but he called in and said, I've got a good one for you. So we were called down and had a look at the early stages of construction. They had the facade up and it was at this point they put their hand up and said, we don't know what to do with this thing. It's one of the few buildings I've ever come across that's basically unfixable. That's what it looks like on a drawing. Imagine getting that when you're a young engineer on a job and saying, i right, I'll build this. But the really interesting part was this. There's the architecturals for this building. And I'm afraid it's probably a bit small on the screen there. I can't think we can zoom that up. No, I can't do that from here. But what it basically says is balcony drain, sea hydraulic plans. Now, I frequently come across that where that says sea hydraulic plans and the hydraulic engineers drawing say for fall sea architect. And you go to the architect, the architect says for fall sea structural engineer. Frequently, yeah? In terms of accountability, everybody's waiting for the thin black line to be laid on the top and make it all go away. The very nature of the problem that our industry has. But how about that? For the same job, that's the structural engineers drawing for that balcony. Because it's a big cantilevered, you know, pretty jazzy kind of facade. That's the cantilever support that was happening. And somehow they've got to waterproof that thing with all those construction joints, flat plates, water not able to drain away, and no consideration for how water will flow to the outlets. The engineer had never met the architect. The architect was only brought on by the developer for early schematic designs and early drawings such as those. And then they saved money by shifting it through to DNC and getting this young construction team who called me in to then try and finish the design off. And that's the sort of, that's the sort of result. Oh, that's the engineering one that I was just talking about, sorry. So it's an extraordinary structure. But don't worry, that 0.8 millimetre liquid membrane that's put on Friday afternoon and Saturday morning will fix it all. And then the tiler will come in. And then David will come in. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the sort of situation we're faced in. How do you make that work? And water doesn't care about all of those stories. It just doesn't care about them. Water needs to flow, and if it doesn't flow, it'll cause mischief. Another example, the bathroom. Uh, this will be near to some of your hearts, I know, in this room. Bathroom detail, high-class um, uh, structure, very top-level um, architect and builder. There's um, 600 apartments. Uh, no, there's 400 apartments, about 600 bath bathrooms, all marble and tile. And let's see. We've got rising damp at 10th floor up. We've got 200 bathrooms that are leaking. We've got litigation has commenced. It'll be um, a 30 million, it's a $30 million claim. All 600 bathrooms are being asked to be replaced. But this is what our industry does. This is a breakdown of all the elements below the shower screen in this bathroom that I saw. And in that, you'll see that there are 35 separate processes in just underneath that shower screen that we're asking a bunch of p different people at different times, usually without much light, usually in wet environment, to get absolutely right to make that bathroom work. There are none of the laws of the flow of water and of respecting the need for water to escape and to drain in this. In fact, what we did have was because there was, they saved money by having a single outlet in the shower for the whole bathroom, they then had pipes running under the shower screen through the water stop to drain water from the bathroom into the shower area. And this builder had spent the last four years repairing it the same way, by the way. Or the, actually, the tiler did. He, the, tiler, the poor subby tiler was doing it for free. That's the stuff I come back to all the time. And what about this one? In terms of waterproofing, 
This isn't waterproofing, is it? This is a metal roof. But when the frame system is too light and it bends and the thing sags and the water gets in through the seams, our industry doesn't say that's waterproofing, but interestingly, they, they bring in the waterproofing consultant or the waterproofer to come and fix it. So in our current definition of waterproofing, which is just membranes and sealants, none of these considerations of the fall in the concrete, the design, the movement in the substrate, none of the considerations about box gutters or cavity walls, cavity brick walls, are considered. That's not part of that definition that the industry's been using for 20, 30 years, which has served our industry so badly. And what about windows and facades? Well, are windows waterproofing? Are flashings waterproofing? No, they're, they're windows. That's in the facade contract. That's the facade engineer's gig, yeah? But what we do is to put some goo on the bottom there to stop it coming in. Or well, that's our mindset. Here's an example of the build-up of how this occurs on a job. I was brought in, I think it was uh, two months before completion, city uh, job, basement leaking everywhere. So I went back through the drawings, because that's part of what we do, is to go through the drawings, because usually I can see the leaks on the drawings. They're always there. And here is the architect's interpretation of how he was going to do the basement walls. So you can see there's a, just some dirt, there's a um, contiguous pile, then a cavity, and then a brick wall and a slab. Fairly basic drawing. I was to learn later that the architect was only hired for 50% and it was taken off the gig. And again, handed over to DNC and a bunch of subbies then under their DNC subcontracts were supposed to finish it off. But this is what I then see in the drawings. That's the engineer's interpretation of the same detail. So it's got some gravel and it's got a block wall and it's got a bit of mesh. There's still no water getting out of this system, by the way. There's no flow of water in this case. By the way, that wall on the left has water flowing down it from the adjacent street. So there's a very high a water table. That's the hydraulic engineer's interpretation of the same detail that he was designing to. And of course, hydraulic engineers, if, if in doubt, put in a pipe. So there's lots of pipes. When we came in there, we found a whole lot of cut off and capped pipes in the surface of the concrete because everybody had seen those and said, we don't know what that's for. The concreter obviously hadn't seen any of these drawings. And the form worker wasn't interested. And so the pipes were all cut off. And so as a result, the builder then interprets it the best way he can on the run. This is design on the run. And so it leaks everywhere. There was uh, $700,000 held against the builder by the developer. And those were in the days when there was no other a co really good remedy. So you can see when we forensically have a look at this, instead of blaming the tiler only, we go back and have a look at what was the coordination of design? Was it the developer just saved money on not f commissioning designers right the way through? Or did the developer spend the money and he was let down by the designer? We don't know that story. All we know is it, it leaks. And leaks profusely right across the industry. But there is a better way. I've been working with the commissioner and his team. We've been looking at the wording of the building code, particularly with damp and weatherproofing. And we've noticed that in the current BCA that there's seven different ways to describe water, for example. We're looking at the standards. But my suggestion here tonight is don't wait for that to happen because it's a long process. There is much that those in the room can take under their own wing and take accountability for their own role in this saga. And the better way is this. Let's see. We're a little bit out of sequence. There we go. Okay. so. We're looking at redefining waterproofing. Rather than it's just a membrane and a sealant that then breaks down later on, we're looking at uh, waterproofing about it being the collection, the redirection and drainage of water. That's what that says up there, is it? Okay. That then encompasses the whole range of things that happen in a building. 
and it encompasses um, the natural energy of water and the time proven um, strategies of building through time. And here's one example. If we take this, this is Delphi Oracle, the Delphi Oracle place. This is the proscenium and it is a stage. And down the, the, on the, the, that circle is a drain. All that water collected by that, um, that uh, sta the, um, the stairs is taken down and it's taken into a thing called a Europus at the bottom. The water is then taken around and put into a tank below for use as drinking water. All through time, there's known to be ways in managing water and it's about letting water flow rather than collecting it. But it's let making it go to a place where it doesn't do cause harm. We've got ancient, uh, we've got texts such as the uh, Vitruvius in 10 BC that also has wonderful descriptions of how to handle water. In fact, there's more information about managing water in Vitruvius in 10 BC than in the current BCA. There's details there of how to place concrete with a 1 in 80 fall to its surface and the importance of doing that and how to cure it. How to prevent efflorescence coming up through uh, uh, tiles. Should read a copy sometime, it's quite good reading. So what we're talking about is going back to basics. He's just saying water doesn't like to be held stagnant. It needs to flow. And it isn't about sealing things up. A tile roof is full of many holes but it's arranged in such a way as to make sure that it doesn't cause damage, that it's collected, redirected, and drained. We're talking about waterproofing being the coordination and the flow of water and anticipating building movement, not waiting for it to happen and then say, oh, that's a surprise. So when we have a look at this Greek material, it's about now engineers taking the, uh, being accountable for bringing the information forward to the table so that designers can plan around that. In the um, Design and Building Practitioners Act, the regulations, there will be provisions there for movement joints and construction joints to be marked in a red line on architectural drawings, which they get from the engineers, and beside it to have the number of millimetres of movement in 10 years. So it's on the drawing. Everybody knows about it. It's not a surprise. You can call for these sorts of uh, deflection charts from your engineer. This, in this case, the blue is deflecting, deflecting downwards in a floor slab, and the red is hogging upwards. Now that's pretty important because we've come across a building recently that had 160 millimetres deflection in a balcony after two years. And the outlet was upstream of that deflection. And we then blame the tiler for not getting the falls right. Yeah. So it's about engaging each of the people who are accountable for their part of the story and their piece of the puzzle bringing them to the table, coordinating that to manage the flow of water so that it doesn't cause harm. This is a drawing from about 30 years ago in a building in Queensland, beautifully worked out, an engineer's drawing showing the reinforcement to have integral falls in a slab, integral hobs, so that water doesn't cause mischief. We're currently looking at putting that into the BCA, is to change it so that no external concrete slabs exposed to water shall be poured flat. They shall all have 184, just like uh, Vitruvius mentioned in 10 BC. There's simple strategies like these, which is pavers on support pads or timber, timber decking with the falls on the membrane underneath. And you might even be able to get away with a liquid membrane in that extreme case. And one of the things is you can get up and take one or two tiles and repair it without having to strip up everything. It's $30,000 for stripping up a, a, a full balcony in a, in a block of units. And I've just finished doing a building where the builders had to do 100 of them. So, key theme in getting those designs to be buildable, because a lot of the time we see that these things aren't buildable like that um, ornate building, that white building we looked at before. 
So in getting everybody to be accountable for their part of the design process, a critical factor is to be looking for simplicity before complexity. This is a diagram from about 40, 50 years ago, CSIRO document, vertical fin in uh, precast elements, which is the waterproofing for an open drained uh, precast elements. Very simple. But simple is not the same as dumb, by the way, and it's not the same as easy, but it's the best way and it's a more buildable way. Because there's elements like this one, is that, that's a box cutter there? One of the industry's favorite things, a box cutter, I'm just advising on this design at the moment. That box cutter is at the base of a 40 meter long skillion roof and the box cutter goes for 100 meters long. In that cross section of detail that we see there, there are 63 different parts that make up the box gutter and the glazing that's been put next to it. And if I had my pen, I'd be able to show it there, but on the left-hand side is that skillion roof, and imagine the water coming off and hitting the bottom of that uh, glazed um, window that's on the other side of it, which is over the main atrium. So that's what we call not building in forgiveness in design. That's generating a definite fault. And when the guys on site and ladies on site try to make that work, They'll try to keep re redesigning it, often make it worse, and it fails. They'll then blame those people for trying to juggle it. So simplicity. Like this way of solving um, a, a problem. Is that one? Yep. Versus that way of solving a problem. So that's the old way of waterproofing, using sealant to goo up everything you can. What we're talking about now is a simpler a simpler form. Collection, redirection and drainage of water, deflecting it, managing water, managing the movement, without having to rely on sealants and membranes to last forever, like our industry seems to have become used to over all these years. So one of the last points then is to recall this, and this is from ancient writings as well is to fundamentally that everything is built twice. So, you can build it once on paper and in prototype and in workshop and converse and finalize the design and then build it the second time for real or you get going and have a partial design because you've saved money on, think you save money on designers and then get going with construction because you will certainly then have to build it a second time in repair. We looked at those ratios before of $1 versus 100. It's far cheaper to design and build first on paper. It's cheaper to rub out lines on the paper than with a jackhammer on reel and then build it for real. That's the essential learning that our much of our industry hasn't done. There have been elements though that have done it exceptionally well. I know when I first was in doing consulting about 20 years ago, people like uh, Meriton and Multiplex and so forth had a lot of trouble with quality. They've rectified that. They haven't waited for the new building code or new standards or new regulations. They've just put in place things like this. They build those things on paper completely first and then build them second time for real. So I wouldn't mind just finishing on this final slide. This is perhaps the most important one of the lot. In terms of the industry learning, and improving, just as David was calling, making that call for. This is an outlet uh, mixer for a, in a shower. There were something like 400 showers in this building complex that I looked at. And this was with a tier one builder, a major complex. In this case, it was a hospital. I went through all of that structure and I wasn't and I was doing the audit, I suppose the equivalent of what David does, but a major audit on this, this structure, in a bipartisan way, I might say. I wasn't able to see, detect one failure in any of the, this major construction anywhere. But we came to one bathroom and found that there hadn't been a priming of the membrane as it turned out under this mixer, and we cut that and peeled it away. And the extraordinary thing to me was one of 
two weeks later, I got a call from a senior manager at that major company. And he said, can I have that photo, please? And I said, why would you want that one? It was a very good result. And he said, no, I want that photo because I want to show our team how to avoid that happening next time. That's a part of everything's built twice. In this case, this tap fixture was built once wrong. They're going to now build it a second time properly on the next hospital little major, major high rise that they do. The 400 mixes that, that they do in a bathroom will be done with the primer in the right way. It's corporate memory. It's just wise risk management. It's smart building. So that's the suggestion. Is one is toss out the old idea of waterproofing. It's not serving this industry well and it's not serving many of the people in this room well. Adopt not a new definition of waterproofing, it's actually a call to an old definition, the way it should be. So manage the collection the, um, and the drainage of water. Get the designs done well in advance and you'll avoid this scene that so often I come across during construction and that's half a dozen people scratching their head trying to work out how the hell to make that threshold detail, waterproofing detail at a balcony work when they haven't got any height, they've got no room, they've got no falls and they've got no hope. It was three years before when the developer started that process that the answers needed to be put in place. I'd like to say that in fact after you've worked out your, um, your rate of return on the project, the next thing I suggest you do as a developer, the developers in the room, is get your designers to work out where the downpipes are going to go and then fit the building around that. Because the other strategy of building the building and then squeezing in some downpipes later just isn't working for us all. They're the people on that screen that I'm concerned about and I know that David's concerned about is the good young people that are trying hard in the industry to make it work but they're handed hospital passes. And we, the older ones or the experienced ones or the ones in authority, are the ones that often hand that to them. And that's the opportunity that the industry has before it right now. So I just the only final point would be to say is that it's probably wise for those that are already on this trail, and I know there are a number here that are already on this trail. There are some that will ignore it, but if they do choose to ignore it, then perhaps they'd better learn to swim. Okay, thank you very much. Wow, that was excellent, Ross, really. Um, you know, for a banker watching and listening and seeing all that, it was um, an eye-opener. Um, but um, it's quite obvious the, um, the Phoenicians and the Babylonians knew a lot about, uh, about construction, and there's a lot, of, um, a lot of people here tonight who are from... Phoenician descent, so um, where there's a, a lot of talent. Well done to you all, and uh, there's room for improvement as, as there always is, but David mentioned that um, all the tilers run out when he arrives at a site. Now I know why they all come in real quick when the bankers arrive, right? So, you know, activity is what's at a building site. And when a banker visits, they want to see activity. They want to see that the building is moving along. So it's quite interesting, you know, the dynamics of what goes on. Um, David, would you mind uh, stepping up here? We've, we've, um, we've got um, Dr. Hesham, who's um, collated quite a few questions from the floor. So I'll ask him, being an engineer, to, um, to ask the questions and um, um, we'll take it from there. Thanks. You, you've got one question. No. no. About three? Come up. Commissioner, a question for you. Uh, what changes are expected in the regulations when they come through uh, into force on the 1st of July? I think the regulations are pretty well out there. So who's, who's actually had a look at the regulations in the room? Has anyone... Put your hand up if you've, if you've read the regulations. Gee, it's less than 34%. That's pretty scary. Um, look, I can't tell you what's in them. Uh, it's, they're going to be quite interesting. Uh, they're all published there. You can see them. If that's all the people that have read them to this point, God help you. Ross, uh, 
Will we see some changes coming through soon in the waterproofing code? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, how do you answer that diplomatically? We are very much, we're deeply involved in getting that through. Um, we're hopeful for changes in the 2022 BCA, for example. It might be the 2024. Um, wheels are in motion, I think that's what people say. Um, so I think the key point, though, is that's the wrong question, is don't wait for that to happen. That, in, in, some, in many ways, the BCA and standards are documents to sue by, in many cases. Uh, they, they can be documents to build by, but there are a lot of the fundamentals there that need to be put in place that don't wait for the standards and the BCA to tell them to let the common sense solutions is all my suggestion, yeah. How can a product have a code marked now and later revoked and a builder slash developer be liable? Pretty simple answer here. Builder signs the building contract. Builder's responsible for delivering that contract. You're allowed to subcontract the works, but the contract says if you've subcontracted the work, it doesn't relieve the builder from having as if they had performed the work themselves. I'm constantly confronted with people saying, why don't you stop this at the border? Stop this product coming at the border. That's not the government's job. You order it, comes in sea containers, turns up on the job site. If it's the wrong stuff, it's the wrong stuff. If it leaves the factory and it's got code mark on it, that doesn't mean it's going to turn up on the job site in a condition that it should be. You're the builder. You've got the responsibility. Do it right. Pretty simple. We have observed draft audit reports taking over three months to be finalised. Why aren't you getting more resources and who pays if you're wrong? <laughs> okay, we, st we stood up legislation on the 1st of September. I think uh, we had about 15 auditors at the time. We had 480 projects notified. They're within six months of an OC and 220 of them said they were within two months of an OC. So we had to mobilise, we had to get out there. We, we're not gonna say we were perfect in the first three months, but I'll tell you now, we're getting better. We'll try and turn that around in two weeks is our goal, um, Matt. So three, two or three weeks, two weeks. So we'll start to see two weeks. Um, I'm sorry, but um, you know, the projects that we saw were really very perplexing. We took a bit of time to write them up. And frankly, I'm not worried if it costs a bit of time to wait until you get them. Get it right and you won't need to worry about getting a report because the jobs that we saw that were all green, we were done and dusted in a single day and we walked out and said, no story here, good luck with the rest of the project. So not hard, shoot for green and you won't be seeing us again. By the way, uh, Commissioner, these are not my questions, just to put it on the record. <laughs> This, this, this is you getting even, right? I know. <laughs> um, let's put it this way. Why do you dislike the plastic alternative formwork system and do you think uh, that it would, you would consider making self-compacting concrete mandatory as required in any government slash public work projects? Anthony, I'm not going to get drawn in that conversation right here, right now, other than to say... I am seeing so many bad examples of uh, alternative formwork systems. There's got to be something wrong. I always take the view, if you're going to come up with something new, it should be better than what it's replacing. And I'm afraid that if I'm looking for class two, maybe even class two finishing, most of the stuff I see wouldn't even come within QE. It actually wouldn't be suitable for class four for burying in a trench. So sorry about that, but I want to see stuff turn out better than I'm saying. On a recent job, you had um, some of your uh, auditors come on and inspect the, do their report or their audit report, and they um, pointed out that there could be some failure in the waterproofing on the roof and on the threshold of some of the balconies. However, that particular builder has got uh, some certification from an expert that basically uh, talks about that the whole system is right and everything complies. So the question mainly he points out that does the certification coming from the expert 
override any prohibition notice that your team may issue. Uh, we've got some pretty experienced uh, inspectors. They come from really good educated backgrounds and come with a lot of experience. Uh, we're seeing a bit of pushback with a few interpretations of what we're seeing. Um, I'd back what our inspectors are coming up with. Um, when we're drawing a line in the sand, we have a good chat about it. I think the message here is this. You should get those people to come and advise you to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Because I'm hearing too many people shopping for what they want to hear as opposed to what they need to hear. Pretty simple. Thank you. Um, two more questions. I've got a dozen of them, but we're just choosing two of them. What's the role of a fair trading in regulating overseas building products? Not their problem. And if you're going to buy non-compliant ballasts for light fittings or non-compliant materials, you're making a very reckless decision. We've got Australian standards for a reason. Check out that this stuff complies with Australian standards. We're not the border force. We're not going to try and be it. If you're stupid enough to go and buy the cheapest rubbish that you can find and bring it here, then book a ship to take it back from where you got it. I guess uh, the final question, the BCA is grey on some areas of compliance when obtaining an expert judgment in order to provide a performance solution. On many occasions, the, construction, uh, the consultants providing this judgment have different and varying opinions which can be challenging in future. How do you propose to address this issue? Well, it's probably a good segue to say this is the last question and the last answer. We are challenging Engineers Australia to become professional. At the moment, Engineers Australia describe themselves as a voluntary membership club, a voluntary organisation over which they like to set standards for entry, they like to convene group hugs so everybody can get together and feel good, but they want no responsibility for taking an engineer out the back and take, making them responsible for the appalling stuff that I'm seeing. I, out of all of these projects, I send and share them with Engineers Australia, and guess what? Not once have they come down and said, who's the engineer doing that? Not once, because they just don't want to know. They're like doctors used to be 20 years ago, where they simply buried their mistakes. So the answer to that is that I've seen litigation. Who's read the article called The House With No Peers. Has anyone in here read that? Okay, well, tap into your Google or whatever it is and look up an article called The House With No Peers. This is a couple who bought a house north of Coffs Harbour. The building contract said, this house shall have peers. The builder took it upon himself that he didn't think they were necessary so he didn't put them in. The house has since settled and cracked. The consumers went to the Office of Fair Trading to get some help and the Office of Fair Trading let them down and we're going to try and avoid that in the future aren't we Matt? Because it was actually a pity that in fact the Office of Fair Trading didn't intervene at that time but on it went. So there was off to the courts and the builder was able to hire engineers that went out and had a look and their testimony was th that the peers were there. Two engineers testified that the peers were there. A third engineer was appointed by the owners to come back and be part of a conclave to actually agree that the peers weren't there. The conclave agreed that the peers weren't there. The conversation occurred on the third day of an NCAT hearing and NCAT lost the tapes of the third day and the judges did, said, well, we didn't hear that evidence because the evidence wasn't recorded and awarded against these customers. 
Now they've got a house worth $400,000. It's got a crack right down the middle of it. I don't know how to fix it. Not a case of just trying to jack the slab up. More serious than that. They've had $160,000 of costs awarded against them. And that turned on the unethical, incompetent, expert opinion of two engineers who were prepared to argue the indefensible. So my proposition here is the professional associations need to become professional. If you want to be regarded respectfully going forward, become professional, become ethical. And I don't want to hear of engineers arguing things like the peers are there when they're not. I drove up to this project in the middle of a COVID period, 130 kilometres north of Coffs Harbour. It was a big effort to get up there. But I crawled down in the trenches under this house. The, the customers dug up the side of the house. So when I got there, I was able to put my hand in underneath and there were no peers. How in the hell are engineers prepared to sell their bodies to a process where they turn up as an expert witness and argue that there were peers there when there were none? I wrote to Engineers Australia and said, what are you prepared to do about it? And they wrote back and said, ground conditions are an imprecise science. You could go either way on whether you needed peers or not, yaddy yaddy. And we don't have any mechanisms to discipline our members. Sorry about that. So my call out to engineers is, not only to clients now, engage an engineer properly and make sure that they do their job, but second of all, on the other side of that, if I catch you giving false testimony at the expense of consumers in this industry, I will name you. End of say. Thank you. Uh, David and Ross, thank you very much. And um, can we just put our hands together and thank them for our <laughs> presentations?